Thank you, Helen. Tim, we're going to um, have God's word brought to us now by Tim. Let's just pray for him. So it won't just me praying. If you could pray as well. I was going to say he needs all the prayer he can get, but that's (laughs) that's not what I meant. (laughs) But uh, anyway, so Father, thank you for Tim. Thank you for the word you've given him today. Just pray that as he speaks to us, um, you would speak to him through your spirit and that our hearts would be open to you as well as we listen. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. I'm always very grateful of your prayers, whether they are few or whether they are many. And just before I start, I just wanted to echo what Brendan said and just a massive thank you from me for the generosity that you have shown, and particularly as we are facing, obviously, a cost of living crisis at the moment. It is, um, it's, it's overwhelming, actually, when, when, I, when Brendan showed me those figures, so thank you from me, too. Now, I imagine after hearing our reading today, you're thinking that I'm going to start talking about mountaintop experiences and valley lows, because that's the standard theme, isn't it, when we think about the transfiguration. But there's so much more in the reading than that analogy. The transfiguration is part of a scripture that those of us who've been in the church for any length of time know immediately what it refers to. If I say the transfiguration, oh yes, that's when Jesus went up the mountain most and Elijah appeared. We know it refers to a supernatural event that shows Jesus' divinity. I want us to think this morning that the scene we heard about is a parallel and a contrast to the crucifixion. After all, we're heading towards Lent. We're heading towards Easter. Today is the last Sunday before Lent. Of course, as we get to Wednesday, our minds switch gear as we change season from what I hate the church calling ordinary time, because nothing's ordinary in the church, but as we move from ordinary time into Lent. It reminds us of this journey that we go on from the transfiguration to the crucifixion. So today, as we think about the transfiguration, I want to encourage you to also hold the crucifixion in your mind. This is what Tom Wright says about the transfiguration and the crucifixion. He says that here on a mountain, Jesus is revealed in glory. At the crucifixion, on a hill by Jerusalem, Jesus is revealed in shame. Here on the mountain, the clothes are shining white. There, they've been stripped off, and the soldiers have gambled for them. Here, Jesus is flanked by Moses and Elijah, two of Israel's greatest heroes, representing the law and the prophets. There on the hillside, he's flanked by two criminals, representing the level to which Israel had sunk in rebellion to God. Here, on the mountain, a bright cloud overshadows the scene, But there on the hillside, darkness comes upon the land. Here, Peter blurts out how wonderful it all is. There, he's hiding in shame after denying that he knew Jesus. Here, a voice from God himself declares that this is his wonderful son. There on the hillside, a pagan soldier declares in surprise that this really was God's son. There's a parallel and a contrast. Transfiguration helps us to think about the crucifixion and vice versa. And if we think about those parallels and that contrast between the transfiguration and the crucifixion, I think we can actually draw parallels to where we are in today's society. I don't know about you, but with each day that passes, it feels darker. It feels that there is more to come before we start to see the light. We watch the news. We see the events happening in the world. We see our politicians leading us in ways that perhaps we don't want to be led. We look at what's going on in the world and we cry out, Lord, have mercy. What's going to happen next? Can you believe it is almost a year since Russia invaded Ukraine? And yet here we are, the war still rages on. We want Jesus to be revealed in glory to the world. Yet the world distances themselves from him more and more. Christianity is pushed out of the country's agenda day after day. And those of us who profess Jesus Christ as Lord end up feeling marginalized and ends up like it feels we're putting across a point of view that is either seen as old-fashioned 
or at odds with society. Whilst it might not feel good as we journey through this, it does in many ways help us to remember exactly what Jesus himself faced during his earthly ministry. He was despised. He was accused of doing things contrary to the law, and he went to the cross for it. We know our brothers and sisters elsewhere in the world face that very threat day after day of being martyred for their faith. I wonder, is that going to be the case here in a few years with the way society is going? At the Transfiguration, Jesus is flanked by Moses and Elijah, representing the law and the prophets. At the crucifixion, he's flanked by the two criminals, showing how far Israel has sunk in rebellion to God. Friends, that's where it feels like we are now in this country, that there has been a rebellion against God in the land, and indeed, dare I say it, in the church. In our society, people are no longer biblically literate. Despite the Bible being the best-selling book in the world, it seems to be that people know more about Harry Potter and what happens in those seven books than they know the Bible. I've never read Harry Potter and never will. It just does not interest me at all. But if I was to ask people out there, tell me the story of Harry Potter in two minutes, and then I was to say, tell me the story of the Bible in two minutes, I wonder which would fare best. And I'm not sure I'd like the answer, but it wouldn't be the Bible. Because we are no longer a biblically literate nation, our morals and our values have slipped away from where they should be. Society no longer upholds the values that we are taught through Scripture. And it all feels to add to the rebellion against God that it feels like we are in at this time. I was reminded last week at the encounter of the cycle of the judges, and it feels almost that we're caught in that cycle. God raises up a judge. The nation turns to him. The judge dies. Then the people start rebelling. They end up in battle or a war. And then God raises up another judge. Friends, it feels that we are in that cycle where we are in complete rebellion to God and where we are heading towards war and battle. And it is not a nice place to be. Those of us who profess a Christian faith are often ostracized for doing so. Despite the protection that we have of religious freedoms and things such as the Equality Act, which is supposed to protect us, in fact, Christian values are being pushed out of society more and more. Indeed, in the last couple of weeks, MPs have been suggesting that they remove the exemption the Church of England has under the Equality Act regarding the debacle over same-sex blessings in the church. If MPs start legislating how the church is to be run, then we are in extremely dangerous territory. And it ain't a church I want to be part of, friends. It is the church of God. It is not the church of parliament. It would further wipe away our Christian identity as the church of Jesus Christ in this land. We are in dangerous times. At the transfiguration, the bright cloud overshadows the scene. At the crucifixion, darkness comes upon the land. That's what it feels like for this country. And, again, dare I say it, to a certain extent, the church at the moment. There is a darkness over our land. There is a darkness over the church. It is difficult to see the light break through. Darkness and rebellion seem to be the order of our day. And it's so easy to get sucked into the way that the world thinks, that we start thinking it's all dark, that there is no light. We start losing sight of the hope that we profess. Peter, at the transfiguration, blurts out how wonderful it is. Lord, it is good for us to be here. Yet at the crucifixion, he denies Jesus and runs into hiding. Is there a message to us through Peter's actions at the transfiguration and at the crucifixion? Are we in church on a Sunday blurting out how wonderful God is? Are we singing these hymns? Are we hearing scripture going, yes, Lord, I believe but then we go out into the world and we slip back into a worldly way of thinking. Are we ashamed of coming to church on a Sunday? Years ago, I used to deny to my friends that I went to church. When I lived, I lived nearby, near my mum, and I would say I was just going to my mum's early for Sunday lunch. 
I denied going to church. I denied knowing Jesus. I wonder how many of us deny that in the workplace on a Monday morning. What have you done over the weekend? Oh, I had a really good weekend. You know, I've done this, done that, and the other. Do you actually say, well, I went to church. I worshipped the Lord with my brothers and my sisters yesterday. Do we come to church wanting to go deeper into his presence to know more of him each day, but then go out and disregard everything that scripture tells us when we're in the world? I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. How many of us are like Peter? How many of us want to go out there and declare that Jesus is Lord, but we're afraid of doing so? All of that seems quite downbeat, doesn't it? The transfiguration, it's about these mountaintop experiences. Tim, what are you talking about? You've just given us doom and gloom for the last 10 minutes. But I've just portrayed a situation where it all feels dark. It feels like it's hard work. And I think that is the state of play that we are facing as the church at this present time. But that is exactly, friends, what the Transfiguration account is all about. It's about being surprised by the power, the love, and the beauty of God. It's about learning to recognize that same power, love, and beauty within Jesus. And it's about listening for it in his voice. Not least when he says, take up your cross and follow me. Life might be hard going at the moment. It may feel dark. But there is hope. There is a hope. Across the Atlantic Ocean, I don't know if you've seen the news, at Asbury University, something has been a stirring. On Wednesday the 8th of February, a chapel service began. And it is still going on. Last Tuesday, over 3,000 people had been at that college chapel. People from Singapore, Canada, Hawaii, and New Zealand had visited. It has over 31 million views on TikTok. And there are comments such as, God is moving, revival is breaking out. God desires to keep us out of harm's way. We are going after Jesus. Even now, in the midst of everything that has been happening, God is stirring something new. The power, the love, and the beauty of God seen in the transfiguration is surprising people in Asbury, Kentucky. And it's beginning to spread across the United States, with services now beginning in Alabama, Ohio, and Tennessee. One comment from a Catholic priest who has been to that chapel service says, it challenges parishes to leave their ministerial comfort zones. So friends, how is this going to challenge us to leave our own comfort zones? How and where is God going to surprise us as we move forward? Are we creating the right environment for God to break in and interrupt what we are doing? How would it feel like if in a week's time this very service is still going on? Yes, hopefully we've all gone home and had a shower and some sleep, but we come back. What if this service is still going on? How would we feel? Would we want to run a mile, run 100 miles that way? Or would we want to be drawn in to what is happening if God was to break out in this very place this morning in such a way as he has done in the United States? How would it feel? How would we feel? What if people had visited us from across the continent to come and see what God is doing in, a, in Bushmead, in Luton, in the United Kingdom? How are we going to be challenged by this, to be surprised by the beauty, the power, and the love of God that is seen in that transfiguration? Peter, James, and John go up a mountain with Jesus and witness something supernatural. What if we were to witness something supernatural break out in Luton? Bring it on, Lord, is what I say. Bring it on. How are we going to create that environment, though, for God to do something new? That's where verse 5 comes into its own. This is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. They're very similar words to what is spoken at Jesus' baptism, which we looked at in January. 
Yet at the baptism of Jesus, we often think of those words being directed at us. Indeed, I encouraged us in January to hear God say to us, you are my son, you are my daughter in whom I am well pleased, and I love you. If we remember back to the baptism narrative, it's the first time we see Jesus since he was a child with a price on his head. We don't know much about him at the time because it comes early in Matthew's gospel. By the time of the transfiguration, the reading we had today, we know an awful lot more about him. We've had the Sermon on the Mount. We've witnessed miracles. We've had some teaching. Jesus has predicted his death. All of these things the disciples have been witnesses to. Then here on the mountain, we hear those words said once again. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Then we get those three words that I think the church has not taken seriously enough in recent times. What are the three words? Listen to him. If I take us back to earlier... I mentioned that we've lost a lot of biblical literacy in the country these days. People aren't familiar with the Bible or with Jesus' teaching. If people aren't familiar with the Bible, are they going to be listening to Jesus? Amanda and I were talking about the transfiguration a couple of days ago, and she said, listen to him. Well, if we aren't listening to him, we're just filibustering. And I thought it was such a good analogy. We're just speaking for the sake of speaking, not actually listening for what is to come. We're just speaking to to delay a decision being made. Are we just constantly talking to Jesus to delay making a decision that will change our lives? Are we constantly talking to Jesus and not listening to him for what he is asking us to do in this season of darkness and despair that is all around us? Perhaps if we were to take it seriously and listen to him, we too could be surprised by the power, the beauty, and the love of God that we've read about this morning. What would that surprise look like if it came for ourselves? What would that surprise look like if it came for the church? What would it look like if it came for our nation? If we aren't listening to Jesus, then what hope do we have, friends? Perhaps those three simple words give us back that hope that we need. I mentioned a few weeks back we need to rediscover our identity as children of God. We need to learn that God is our daddy, our papa, our abba. Perhaps if we can rediscover that, perhaps if we can rediscover that our identity is as his children, we will start to listen to Jesus more. If we are listening to him, Maybe he will guide us once again and that we too can learn to be surprised by him once again. I believe that the days ahead look dark and dangerous for all of us. But I also believe that we, as God's children, are being prepared for something new. Perhaps it's a change of thinking from the church being in decline Perhaps it's to start thinking that it's not an outdated institution, but it's to start thinking this is the process of rebirth. Yes, the church has been in decline, but the church is growing. Don't let the media tell you otherwise. The church is growing in this country. Perhaps we need to look at it as a rebirth. It's not an outdated institution. Well, maybe it is an outdated institution, but perhaps this is part of the rebirth process that we need to go through as God's children to reclaim the church for Jesus Christ once again and to stop pandering to the wills of society and culture. Whatever happens following that decision of General Synod last week, perhaps the church needed to be swayed to make a decision at odds with Scripture but in line with society and culture so that something new can emerge. Perhaps that decision a week ago was to kill off the Church of England as it currently is. And yes, I am saying this, and yes, it's being recorded, and yes, it will go on YouTube. I don't mind. I just want to speak the truth. Perhaps it needed to be taken for the Church of England to die in its current state so that it can be reborn into something new and majestic once again. Last week, somebody in this congregation shared with me a prophecy about the Church of England that it is being raised up It will look ancient and it will look new. 
It will have its liturgy at the heart of it, that ancient tradition that we have inherited from years and years of faithful servants of the church. But it will look new. And I wonder if that new is because we will finally stick to this book. We will finally stick to the word of God. I think it's more important than ever that we do that as society moves further and further away from this book, that we in the church have to be surprised by the love, the power, and the beauty of God once again. Because if we're not going to be surprised by it, how are people out there going to be surprised? They want to know what's going on in the church. And we want to need to then go out and tell them, this is what's happening in the church. Do you want to be a part of it? As Tom Wright says, if you want to find the way, the way to God, the way to the promised land, you must listen to him. Friends, this morning, can I encourage us to really try and start listening to Jesus? Maybe we're thinking we don't know how to do that. But it's a skill that we can learn. We learn to listen to each other. Watching Hannah learn to understand what Amanda and I are saying or asking her is a joy. I like to think that the Lord feels similar about us when we actually listen to him. Or perhaps it's more a, finally they're taking note of me. We're very good at responding when someone asks us to do something until that request comes from God. We do a Jonah and run the opposite direction. We want to be surprised by that love, that power, and that beauty of God once again. We want to learn to become more and more like Jesus each day. So as we reflect on the transfiguration today, keeping in mind the hill of the crucifixion, let's learn to listen to Jesus afresh once again. Let's be prepared to be surprised by him, as I believe he is waiting for us before he will act. If we want to see something like Asbury happen in this land, let's look at those parallels. Let's see the darkness and let's speak hope into the darkness and the despair. Friends, let's be ready to be surprised by God because he is up to something new. The question is, are we willing to listen to him or are we going to go about it our own way as we are so very good at? Let's pray. All-powerful God, we are troubled and at times frightened by the terrible news of events in our world. It's as if journalists sifting through massive amounts of information strain out everything about you, Lord, and show nothing of what you are accomplishing on the earth. Whenever your world is feeling like a scary place, help us to turn to you and be encouraged in your presence. As the world appears to grow increasingly dark, Remind us that you are the light of the world. Help us to ponder your awesome glory and power, to find courage through remembering who you are and to delight in your unfailing love. May we rejoice that we are on an adventurous journey with you in which our ultimate destination is heaven. May we not waste energy worrying over things over which we have no control. But may we focus our energies on doing what we can to brighten the place where you have put us. May we use our time, our talents, and our resources to push back the darkness and to shine your light wherever we are. May we learn once again to listen to you and to be surprised by your beauty, by your love, and by your power. Amen.